welcome to how to make YouTube your full-time job. I'm very excited today to have Alan Spice with me, who is from the UK, just like me, we're a rare breed. He's a YouTube consultant, advisor, mentor, and I've learned a lot from him on his YouTube channel. Um, he always pops up on search in some of the most unexpected places. And that's one thing I want to talk to him about today, strategy and how Alan has built his YouTube channel and turned it into a business using some techniques that we'll run through now. So, Alan, tell us how you got started on YouTube. It's it's kind of a long-winded explanation. I've been around for about 11, 12 years on, on the internet. I was a web developer when I first started. And as a web developer, the magic of building websites was fantastic until people start discovering things like GoDaddy and Wix and stuff like that. So I needed... learn what this video thing was so i dug around on youtube which at that point was around about three four five years old already but then i started uploading stuff for me and my clients frequently asked questions type that kind of stuff as i started making these videos i realized how liberating they could be now the first video that i ever made was terrible and cringy and in the background there was washing up and i'm using a, a shaky hand camera thing that has terrible audio but as you learn how to create content i started to to like how i could just say anything i wanted had my own little bubble create pieces of content that i could either push people in certain directions or have them interact with me so i'm not just in my own head anymore i can share a thought and people can enjoy my frustration or my my joy over something and it became fairly addictive now at that time i started creating content about random things in my life building a channel up to around about forty-five thousand subscribers 40 odd million views and each little video i was able to see if i tweak this and i change that and i can i can learn something new i can teach my web development clients that look this this is how i do stuff about my life so imagine how you do this about business. Now, I very soon realized that although it's a great way to express myself, it's also very hard to monetize if you're in the wrong niche. Now, I was creating content that was humorous and slightly adulting content, humorous, but not something that YouTube wanted to monetize when the first big wave of demonetization came across. So... I had to learn that I can take this experience and teach people how I grew that YouTube channel and I can monetize that. Or I stick with this hobby that is fantastically fun, but in the long run will fade away. People get it. No one wants to see a 35 year old dude being a teenager. It's just a bit weird. So in the long run, I felt, okay, I can take my business experience, parlay what I learned from this hobby and start my next step start making money start making a business a foundation stepping away from web development because web development was dying not everyone's you're either going to spend a lot of money for a custom website or you're going to go and use godaddy or wix and stuff like that and unfortunately i was stuck so it was soon time for me to step into video and that's when youtube was my next port of call my next business to attack so when we spoke last week we were chatting about your strategy and how you built a youtube channel and how you were kind of really refined for the first three years and now you're currently growing at around 1600 subscribers i think you said a month which is very fast so can you talk us through how you've done that and what your idea was for doing this at the start because it sounded like you've always had a plan okay well see i always knew and i've, al I've always been a, a long-term thinker and I always knew that it's going to take time to build anything. It's a business, full stop. And most businesses fail within the first six to eight months, unless you forward plan. So I knew from my experience when it comes to optimization that you have to start hooking people in based on what they want. So I looked through my head and I figured out that, right, I'm going to teach people YouTube. How about I figure out what they need, what they would need from me? So I figured out the, the most commonly asked questions, the 20, 30 most commonly asked questions that I would ask as a new YouTuber. So if I could go back to the start of my eight years, what would I, I, I have asked people like Roberto Blake or Nick Nimmin or Tim Schmoyer, right? 
And if I could note these down and answer them in a more human fashion, then people would start to find me, get their answer, trust me, and then hang around. Also, if you can start adding something that's slightly different. Now, because my other channel was entertainment, I've always been a bit quirky. I'm not dry. I'm not a lecturer in a university. I'm a, a YouTuber with a personality that's also teaching you something about your business or about YouTube. So I knew that in the long run, if I, if I could plant these seeds and plant the evergreen content somewhere down the line, I could then slowly monetize that by including like affiliate income or teaching people that, hi, you can trust me. So why don't you work with me one-on-one -on -one somewhere? If you build the foundations and then build on top of it a quite slow, painful process, you it does pay out in the long run. Very um, much so. And many, many people don't seem to understand that. Most people are, are hoping for that viral hit or that instant success. And YouTube isn't like that. The, the, the top of the, the peak is, is very rarefied air, but we only ever get to see that peak because that's the thing that's served to us in trending or searches or the instant viral successes that everybody deals with from day to day. You don't see the, the two or three years worth of grind that someone may have done to learn those camera skills or that scripting skill or video editing or whatever it needs to be to, to finally get that viral video three, four, five years down the way. <laughs> well, no one wants to work hard, do they? <laughs> Every, everyone just wants to put, you know, a, a dime in the jukebox and ta-da, there's your favourite song. Um, and yes, there are YouTubers out there that can do that, but they are very, very rare. Janelle Liliana out of nowhere hit the right niche at the right time with the right title and the right length and magicked her way to success but she is a magic unicorn that doesn't happen very often i kind of feel like it's part of the problem when there's things in the news about fast growth and virality it feels like it happens a, a heck of a lot more than it actually does so I've, I've just got your youtube um i've just got your youtube channel up here and some of the titles are quite obscure there's things like how to delete a youtube channel how to download a youtube video and so on how did you go about finding these terms? Because to get half a million views on a video like that, uh, you might not be thinking that you're onto an absolute screamer when you start, but it clearly is. How did you find that? Well, it's th this is all down to I. There's, there's two ways of of braining when it comes to YouTube, right? Uh, you can either think down the route of sensationalism, which is why you get Mr. Beast saying, "I gave away a." private island for eight hundred thousand dollars or whatever it happens to be um or you get massive fireworks or you get casey neistat doing massive cinematic universe videos right those tap into the human emotion response which is good but fleeting or you can go down the route that the internet is powered by search algorithms youtube is owned by google the largest search engine on the internet and YouTube is the second largest search engine on the internet. So me with my 11 years worth of experience in web development understood that the only surefire way for me to get traffic is to lean into search. Now this means going through every fine detail of the brain. Like as I was saying before, thinking of the first 20, 30 topics that you would ever ask anyone, right? In anything of your niche, like knitting, what's the best wool, what's the best needles, what's the best process, how do I learn to improve this motion, is there a, a better way to hook it through? Anything that you do, there will be basic questions that people will ask, right? All you need to do now is make sure that you know that in the long run they would be asked for today, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. That's why some of those videos, including how to delete your YouTube channel, is a year old and has half a million views. Now, there's also another way around it. Yes, you also need to think of what people will search, but you can also do the hard work and actually search for that as well. Now, there's two search engines, Google and YouTube. You can go into YouTube and type how to delete a YouTube channel and have a look at the most recent videos. Have a look at the ones that are in the, the top 10 ranking, see how old they happen to be see how well they happen to do, see how many subscribers that channel has, right? That way you can see the outliers. If a channel with minimal subscribers 
is ranking really high and getting loads of views, you know that that did well in search somehow. However, if it's three years old, it also means that YouTube might knock it out of its place if you make a newer one that's better than that video. That's the same with the Google search algorithm. Now, the difference here is that you're not just up against videos, you're up against the entire internet, right? But you can rank a video within the snippets of those sections by making sure that the video is good and ranking on YouTube. You can use timestamps in the description that will link you to a specific search term. But you can also do the same trick that I did with YouTube. Go to Google, type in your search term, have a look at the top 10 results. Within those 10 results, which ones are old, which ones have poor authority? For example, forums are known as just crap. They're just pointless, right? But if you're trying to teach people how to do tech reviews and you're bumping up against, you know, TechCrunch and BBC News and BBC Tech and other big industries that you know that's a big name, then you just avoid that search. I mean, you try and get more and more obscure or slightly longer, okay? The difference is that, yes, I ranked on how to delete your YouTube channel, but in the long run, when I first started, I needed to start with longer tail keywords. How to, how to delete your YouTube channel on mobile in 2020. How to add an end screen on a YouTube video using only your mobile phone, right? Because the longer the keyword, the more specific the search, the less results. But you pick up enough of these lower trafficked terms, it builds up authority. It builds trust in you because I've proved to Google and YouTube that, look, I earned these 20 wins. Now, why don't you give me a Hail Mary, a, a slightly harder keyword? And then you work your way up that, that challenge. And slowly over time, you don't just have 20 low-end search terms. You have a few medium and maybe every now and then a, a very high-end one. And then you slowly work your way up through. So that's why consistency is so important. Because you can't just hit 30, 50, 100 search terms with one video. Each video needs to be a pillar in its own right. And not every one of my videos goes somewhere. In fact, 500 odd videos on my YouTube channel, I don't have 500 videos with half a million yeah, views. No. I, wish, I wish I did, but I don't, right? But what you do is you make sure that you, for my strategy is you make sure that you're planting them now knowing that it's not going to be a thousand views tomorrow, but it might be a thousand views in a month's time which then compounds an interest in behavior that makes it 5,000 at the end of month two, and then 10,000 at the end of month three. And then YouTube trusts you more for that search term. And then next time you follow it up with something relevant, they start suggesting between each other. And you really have to Lego brick up because if you don't have enough Lego bricks, then it's pointless. It's just one brick on a, so a little stump. It's interesting because you have this long-term mindset and a lot of people don't, um, they don't have that. And if you go back to when you started, you had to make a decision that was going to really impact your life. What was it that made you trust that eventually all of this work would pay off to the point where you'd be running a really strong business? It's kind of an, an element of a personal quirk. I'm a stubborn person. <laughs> um, it was more of a case of, I, I, I knew over time, like my, my first main channel, which was an entertainment channel, it had taken five years to get to 48, uh, 45,000 subscribers and 40 odd million views. I knew it was going to take time. I was under no delusion because of that learning. Um, it was also very painful to retire the old channel, which had no connection to my business. I couldn't push people from blokey humor to very, very dry tutorials on how to use YouTube. But I knew that after three years of hard work on that channel, that it then started to accelerate because that had the same thing. Three, four, five videos a week, every week for five years in that case. So I knew that if I was able to put out content that was useful, based on all of those learnings, 1,500 videos, five, 600 videos for other clients as well, I knew that in the long run, if you make valuable content, they will find you. There was also an element of gambling. You've got to, you've got to hope, you've got to trust. And yeah, for 14 months, I was singing into a void. Full, it took 14 months to hit 1,000 subscribers. 14. And you're kicking and you're screaming and you're looking at every graph and you look back each month 
and I, I work in 90 and 180 day cycles. That's three and six months. Because if you plant it here at the end of three months, you can look back and see what did well over the last three months. And then based on those, you weed out all of the dead woods and you focus on the one that did well. And then you see how you can embellish that or iterate on that. Uh, what lessons you can learn. Was it a better thumbnail? Was it a better title? Was it a description? Did it link from a website? Now, if you're set in your head, which I was, I knew that somewhere three years down the line that it would do something. I didn't know it would do the quantity of income that it does now, but I knew in the long run that it, it, could, it could win me a consultancy or a client, or I could point to things. I knew in the long run it could make me a, a few hundred bucks a month on like advertising money. But best of all, no matter what, it was a portfolio of video creation for me. And at the time I was video editing and consulting and I could point to clients saying like, if I can do it with a crappy little webcam, right? And a, a little crappy bedsit, then why can't you with your camera in your business? And then that slowly earns their trust, their emails, their contacts. And then I was lucky that search hopped on a couple of my videos and then it grows. And then you get more addicted because you've seen the result of the hard work you've done. And then it just keeps piling on from there. So that's, that's really interesting that you mentioned the portfolio side of things, because for us, we've got a much smaller channel than you, but when it comes to marketing and converting sales, we use our YouTube portfolio and that's kind of where the best return is. I'm not actually sure that when people start a YouTube channel, they consider this because you, you can get some good results at the beginning. So for, for me, your business journey is interesting because you went full time when you had 3000 subscribers, which is crazy. What, what was it that made you think that now was the time to do this? And also when you made that jump, did you find things moved faster in the right direction? Because now you had time to fully focus on growing your channel and your business. See, um, the birth of my YouTube channel came at the time of the death of my web development. So there was still a couple of clients that I was still able to run my day-to-day -day food and gas, electric and rent stuff with. So I was able to slowly wean as the web development died. So I was lucky there, but I also knew horribly my web development died terribly. And when you first start as a, as, as a entrepreneur or a, a freelancer or whatever buzzword you choose to, to, to work as I was working from home selling websites um I didn't realize at the time that I've only got one form of income which means if people stop buying websites for Christmas I'm eating noodles right oh yeah Merry Christmas Billy here have an e-commerce website what I'd have liked that I'd as a kid <laughs> So some people are wired that way, but other people are just like, oh, yeah, but I want in a Nintendo grandma, What? what's this thing? So yeah, so it didn't work. No matter how much I tried and no matter how much I pushed it. And I was always good at, um, my, my former business partner called it pulling an Allen. They were like, oh, oh damn, we need 600 pounds to hit the, 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 the wage run by the end of the month. Uh, we've got two days. Alan, go do it. Right? And I phoned through my client list, they'd be like, oh yeah, yeah, we, we can do, yeah, sure, we, we'll, we'll do that banner, or yes, we'll do that that product, or how about those leaflets, or oh, you need a one-page website, oh, that could be 600 pounds, what a surprise, so I could always meet those, right, but but over time, you find it harder and harder, I, I left, I went solo, solo, with no business partner, and then I, I just realised that, right, my biggest problem with web development is the feast and famine, the roller coaster of, yay, sold a great website that can feed me for a month. And then next month, nobody's buying. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It, it could be snowing, it's raining, they're at school, it's New Year, it's Christmas. From October to February, oh, it's a nightmare. No one, no one's, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm just going to save up for Christmas. Maybe, maybe in New Year. No, you don't mean New Year. You you mean April when the tax year starts and stuff. Right? So it's always a nightmare. So I knew at this point, right, if I'm going to do this, I need to focus on what it is. And my mindset is, is that, right, these videos are entertaining and, and useful, but they're also very tiny mini adverts that aren't adverts. Right? Each of them are showing you this 
guy knows what he's talking about and can help you, right? Even if at that point they were a bit tinny, they were much better because of the past five years worth of experience. So I didn't start a rookie shaking with orange lights. I knew how to frame by then. I knew how to, to talk to a camera. I, I knew how to, to, to think and improvise, which was great. Right? I, I, used, I knew how to, to work off a script, which is good. So all I needed to do now was think how this would fund me. Now, I can either use this as social proof that I know who I am, which when you're growing a YouTube channel on how to grow a YouTube channel and you've got 300 subscribers, people don't tend to trust you that much. Like, I wonder why. oh yeah, oh yeah, you, you want to grow your YouTube channel and you want to get your first 1,000, but you haven't got it, Alan. So yeah, so what I then made a mind on is make sure that in the description there was affiliate links that were relevant to things that I was talking about. And these were like browser-based plugins like vidIQ or uh, captioning services like Rev or anything that I use personally myself. But I would also link through to my website for consulting services and that kind of thing. At that time, I was also doing video editing work for some of my clients. So they would see, look, this is the type of video work that I do. So why don't I help you? So having an arsenal, a toolkit of things that I could do. Now, nowadays it's much more slimmed down. I am a YouTube consultant. I am a YouTuber and I'm a blogging entrepreneur. Entrepreneur is a weird buzzword that people cringe at, but it's the only thing that seems to match, right? But now I've slimmed down, but I had to, when I first started in year zero, do everything. And that's what led to around right about a year and a half in me hitting 3000 subscribers and realizing at this point with video editing here, with the YouTube ads revenue here and a bit of affiliate marketing mixed with the odd sale, I, I could build up an income. But I also moonlit on things like people per hour and Fiverr. Why? Because this builds your rep reputation elsewhere as well. So not only could I go on people per hour and go, look, this channel, this is my proof that you can use me on this platform, but every sale that I got on Fiverr or people per hour, and I went dirt cheap, painfully cheap, right? Each one of those then became a review, a review that I could put on the website, a review that I could put on a blog, a social building that proof, a bandwagoning, a bandwagoning effect. Also, every now and then, someone would be like, hi, can you optimize these three videos for me? Yep, here you go, 15 bucks, da, 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 da. Oh, great, that was really good. How about you review my channel and a channel audit? Oh, you're really good at what you're doing. How about you become my consultant? And then I'm sat on a retainer. So I had to do the seven or eight steps here to get that retainer. But once you've got a retainer, it makes it easier to get the next retainer that gets the next retainer. Because I've got this client. Look at what I've done with this one. You could be one of those and one of those. And, one of, and then by the end of my... I'd say by the end of my second year and I'm, I'm bumping up against like six, seven, 8,000 subscribers, I was more than full time. It was just that the first couple of retainers around about the 3,000 mark. At that point, I was like, right, I don't need to do web development anymore. That's not helping me. It's taking out more of my time than it actually warrants. So I slowly cut that off. And it's that evolution that steps you forward that freed up the time for me to make more content that gives me more social proof, that gets me more retainers, that saves me more time here, that gives me more time to create. And then it's just a snowballing effect. But you need to realize that I couldn't be at where I am now without all of that vi editing videos at 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night, editing videos on Boxing Day because I gave myself Christmas, right? But I'm sat there at my sister's house editing videos at 11 o'clock at night on Boxing Day because I needed to make sure that those videos go to the clients because they're paying to cover me. Yeah. So yeah. it's multiple streams of income all add up. Each one of them might not have made me full time, but five, five like income streams all at 300 bucks each very quickly cover your bills. Mm. You just need to make sure that you're juggling those and you'll get there. Yeah, it's interesting because the advice out there is you know, focus on one thing, put all your energy into it and nothing else. Well, when you don't have any money <laughs> and 
you have to do all the work you can just to sort of stay afloat you, you lose focus I, I love that you've done that and you've grafted and then you've made the switch to being focused on the right things for your business it's, it's, I find it hard hearing business gurus shout at you that you've, you've got to focus on these things and never really considers you know personal situations I've I found the more the more freedom the more time I have the more I yeah I it it, it exponentially grows at the start of this year for example I had um, I just passed 10,000 subscribers around about New Year. I'm now I'm now around about 23, maybe 24,000 subscribers within the next week or so. And it was just because the more I could either give out to somebody, like my blogging, or the more I could slowly remove that took up a lot of my time, like video editing for other people, the more I could then reflip that attention and laser focus it elsewhere. Um, some people continue to focus on the one thing so that they have their base and they'll, they'll do all of the work down here and they'll get laser focused up here that when this starts to fail, they don't know where to go from. Um, that's why I have a, a broadening theory and a broadening strategy to my, my business in the long run. That way it will hopefully not just be the YouTube pinnacle, but I can also add like my, my blogging and my podcasts and stuff like that as well. You know what, it sounds like you're enjoying this and you're doing an amazing job. And I know there are a lot of people who want to get into YouTube and try and turn it into a business. So if you could give them one piece of advice to do so, what would that be? Do the thing that you love. Now, I understand that you may be sat there in a job that you hate, but you don't necessarily have, like, many people have the nine to five. Okay, you, you get up at seven o'clock in the morning, you get washed, you get dressed, you get on the train or your bus, you put on your fancy new mask, right? And you, you, you go to work from nine till five and you get home at six, right? You put your little one in bed at seven o'clock. And then you sit down and you're relaxed and you're tired and you're watching Coronation Street. The difference is there is between that time and the time you go to bed. So from 7.30 till about 10 o'clock at night, You've got two and a bit hours there that you can work on something that you love. And it needs to be something that you love because that will be the thing that motivates you. It needs to be something that you can talk about for hours on end over and over and over again. It doesn't necessarily matter what that thing is. It just needs to be a burning passion that you just want to educate other people with. And nowadays, all you have to do is turn on a camera and talk to it or blog or podcast and you will find your tribe or they will find you it just takes time to do so and a lot of patience because so many people think i love i uploaded three videos where are they oh, that's only three videos <laughs> well, well done there's there's 800 odd hours of video uploaded every day and you want to make one three minute video and think that that gives you rights to to be the next PewDiePie or the next Jacksepticeye or Mr. Beast. It's not how it works. But with patience and with love and the ability to look to the future. That's why I, I didn't I didn't say I'm going to do it in a year. I always have three, four, five year plans in my head. As long as you have the patience and you're willing to plant those seeds or weave that spider web. Right. Either way, they're either going to grow and build you a forest or the spider web's so big that it's catching you all, all of the flies. There's two analogies there that I've muddled up, but I use them both often. <laughs> it still works. But if you love it, and I mean that thing that thing that you see, you, you talk to someone that you know isn't into it and the light goes out in their eyes and they just want to die, right? It's that thing, that thing that you love so much that you don't care, right? You just want to keep talking about it. That's the thing that you build your passion around. And, and then you associate things with it. So that, say you really love kids' toys. I don't know, say, say you're into uh, wrestling figures, okay? And you're, you're reviewing every aspect of that wrestling figure. You can then have a look at services such as where you can buy them, Ebay's, uh, Amazon affiliate links, or r restoration programs, or um, other, other kits, other sets that go around them, or how you're building a shelf that you can you can put on it and then you're selling out to those it's just or you can headhunt things just absolutely anything there's always something an affiliate program somewhere 
that would be related to you or how you preserve it or how you paint it or how you clean it or all of these things are things that you can sell right but you have to love it be willing to talk about it and then understand what fuels your love for that because then they will come and find you yeah that's brilliant i think that's the perfect advice actually you know, people ask us a lot how do we uh, manage to make so much content where do we get the time to release three videos a week but i love it i don't really do much else this, this is the thing that happens to be part of my job and when you love something it overtakes your life to the point that you do have time to do it because you prioritize it over everything else <laughs> so you kind of need to love things more than other you know you kind of need to love youtube and, and making videos and growing a business more than you do love watching netflix and playing on the playstation well, that's it and and, and because i i'm wired in a way that it, that the progress is is the the thing that that fuels me in the long run as well i love being able to go back to my analytics clicking like from 2020 so the last eight nine months and i can see the graph slowly go up that's what gets me <laughs> i know that each little video slowly it moved a little bit up right a little bit at a time right but i then know that the strategy that took me there or the things that I went back and I'm looking at every little tweaks and nudges, but that's because I love it. I love doing these little tweaks. It's, it's self-improvement through mathematical statistical proof, <laughs> right? I know that I did better because look, the graph went up, right? It's great. But then there's always something in something that you love that you can continue to do. If you're in a thing that you hate, people know that you hate it. The fire isn't in your eyes. The, yeah. the smile isn't on your face, right? But if you love it, there's always something else that you can also do. Oh, well, like, like, like um, I'm going to be looking at like microphones or where I'm going to go for a boom mic or am I going to have a, a different new background? Does the background make a difference if I'm vlogging outside? Right now, there's things called YouTube Shorts, which is great because nobody knows what it is. That, that gets me excited because then I can figure out what it is before other people or try and educate people on that thing right if you love it there's always something else that you can nibble on and pull in or going back to the idea of that spider web right if you if you start with your basic 20 30 questions your how to's in the middle as you get more and more excited and, and start touching upon the fringes around that spider web it gets bigger and bigger it catches more flies which accelerates your growth that's why yeah three years ago i was growing at around about 20 subscribers a month well, now I'm growing around about 16, 17,000, 16,000, 16 or 1700 subscribers per month. And it's all compounded because of the passion and how big my reach happens to be. But the reach wouldn't have got that big if I'd just given up after week two. So before we finish up, Alan, let's touch on one last thing. So everyone always rattles on about using social media to market yourself and your channel. And we all know it's important. But you've got a strategy for growing your YouTube channel and your business that I don't actually hear a lot of people talk about anymore. And it's the kind of next stage for your business. And you, you mentioned to me that it's something you're going to do over the next five years. So can you tell us how you're planning on using Google to grow your YouTube channel and your business? I've always struggled at written content. It, it bores me. Um, I'm, I'm an entertainer in my soul i can talk for hours about anything um i fill my brain full of general knowledge and and references and i'm good on camera improvise uh, like improvising at, at any drop of a hat it's brilliant but the writing i know as a web developer is key long form content in written articles can still hook people in through the largest search engine on the internet which is google so if I ignore the largest search engine on the internet while still doing well on the second largest search engine on the internet, I'm kind of turning a blind eye to the possibility of doubling my growth. So I've done all of the hard work of, of getting the YouTube ball rolling. Each and every month I upload an, like eight, 10 new videos each and every month, right? Which will get me more views, which will get me more search terms, which in the long run gets me more evergreen content, which is good. So that's on autopilot right now. I will continue to have a look at the stats and make the videos that I need to make and continue to research the videos that I'm doing and make sure that I'm hitting the, the need from my audience and continue to grow slowly out and out from just a YouTube tutorial channel into a social media tutorial channel 
into business and, and money and entrepreneurship, right? But that's on autopilot, which now means that I've got all of this additional time now that I've eliminated certain aspects of my day-to-day -day video editing grind to focus on blogging. Now, many people started with blogging and then thought, you know what would really help my blog? A video. <laughs> yeah. Now, I've got 500 videos on YouTube. And I knew through picking the video topics that I have, I knew that there are niches out there that I could create content around. And I know that everyone's wanting to learn YouTube. So the plan was, have a look at the videos that did really, really well on YouTube and make content that supports them in a blog. Not, not only am I ripping the video apart and making it fluffy, but I'm also teaching everything that's around that. So it happens to be, what is affiliate marketing? Why use Amazon? Why not Amazon or ClickBank? Other affiliate programs can I use? These are the common questions that people will continue to search, not only on a desktop, but on a mobile phone these days. So the idea is, is yes, I can dominate search in YouTube, but if I can also start injecting these frequently asked questions into a blog and then having those blogs push back to YouTube, YouTube sees session watch time being started from external sources, which means my channel is now an authority on starting session watch time from external sources, which is a, a ranking signal within the YouTube algorithm. It's also an opportunity for me to harvest affiliate links over on the blog as well. Same kind of theory as the, the right at the start, before 3,000 subscribers, video, I link to affiliate marketing links, right? And I hope in the long run that they trust me enough to either hire me as some kind of consultant, or they'll buy Rev for subtitling, or they'll buy my ring light or my web webcam, right? That kind of thing. Now, I can do exactly the same, and I can go into much more detail. Two, three, four thousand words in length. I can explain exactly what the webcam's for, why the webcam, how to set up the webcam, this webcam versus any other webcam. And then I can link to a affiliate links on Amazon or direct manufacturer, and I can build income that way. This way, I also have an independent leg to stand on. As I was explaining earlier, the pyramid happens to be that slowly over time, you eliminate things that cost you a load of time and you graduate towards the tip. And at the tip, you're doing everything laser focused all about your YouTube channel. But what if you say something inappropriate? What if you're Shane Dawson? And you're the largest YouTuber on the platform that then gets canceled and shamed based on behavior that you did five years ago. You're now at the top of a pyramid that no longer wants to serve you traffic. So if you have multiple forms of traffic that you control, you then control your audience. At any point, YouTube's algorithm could decide that it doesn't want to show me anymore. And at that point, my YouTube career is dead. And my business, which is built off the traffic of that YouTube channel, suffers immensely. So if I build a blog over the next three, five years, that blog also becomes a traffic source, which means if YouTube slowly dies, I'm not out on my bum in the cold doing nothing. I have something that tra traffics directly to me, an audience that I can control control in the nicest possible sense, push them towards a podcast or a YouTube channel that's external or some wonderful little banners that you pop up in the middle of your video that explain that you know, there's a call to action right? or a subscribe button, a digital product of some kind. Maybe I'm going to write an ebook. Maybe I'm going to write an actual book, right? If I have more control over my audience, I can push it where I want or use it as a catalyst to continue to grow the YouTube channel even faster. And once the ball rolls, it gathers more mass and it makes it bigger and bigger. So if I've got multiple pillars, I future-proof myself. Yeah, the blog in itself right now has gone from 1,000 organic views in around about March per month to around about 6,000 organic views on my blog posts at the end of this month, all through writing solid content on the understanding that it's not going to be a gold rush now. I want something with authority in three years time to help me. And if I can do it now, whilst this is on autopilot and growing, then it kind of shelters it growing up. I don't have to go, oh, this has died. I now have to work really, really hard to build this back up over three years. I've got something that supports each other. So I was showing images of your blog whilst you were talking. 
uh, to show the, the effort that you put into these vlogs. It's not just ripping off a transcript. You are adding tons of images. Um, we know that Google needs to see things like images, H1 tags, H2 tags, long detailed articles. So there is a ton of work and I've done this on a few of our own videos and turned them into blogs and it's actually taken me longer to make a blog post than it has taken me to make a video. <laughs> it do well, that's it. Like At the end of, we're, we're, we're talking today, um, once I've done this and I've had a nice cup of tea because I'm British, I'm then going to set up my camera and record three or four other videos. Those three or four videos will slowly come out over the next few days, few weeks. <coughs> but a blog post, you have to analyze what the human being is searching. You're playing that algorithm game that I told you about um, earlier. The idea here is that you have to answer laser focus the question that the human has asked and the intent that they had. Okay, so not only are you asking, for example, um, what's the best dirt bike, but you then have to figure out why you're searching for that dirt bike. Are you going to buy a dirt bike for you? Are you kickstarting that? Do you want it automatic? Do you, where are you based? You need to think of all of the things that are relevant to that search term that you can then also rank for. So this also then extends that spider web a bit more, right? There's only so much I can do on YouTube. This can bolster the outside ring of the spider web and it brings more and more people in. But you have to craft it right because if you're not hitting the keywords, if you're not answering the question, then Google knows it. Google knows what spam content looks like these days. It's been Googling itself for 15, 20 years, <laughs> right? Back in the day when you used to be able to keyword spam blogs with white text on white writing at the bottom of a blog post all about money, 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 money. Let's see if we can rank for it. doesn't work anymore. But a well-crafted, useful piece of content that actually brings value to the person that finally read it, that's what YouTube and Google looks for. Because at the point that it realizes it's just trash, there's lots of other articles or other videos that do a better job than you that they'll rank above you. So if I just expand that, make sure that it's a good job and it's useful, other people will find it. Plus, th this is, this is a, a thing that people don't tend to bear in mind. You might not be good on camera, but you might be great at recording your voice. You might not be willing to record your voice for a podcast, but you might be fantastic at writing articles. It doesn't matter necessarily what media, just be on a media. So I suck at writing. So I did video and now I can afford to bolster my weak spot with a couple of writers and me and my knowledge. They write a load of good stuff. I go in and add my expertise and my links and my affiliate marketing and my fluffiness and some nice pictures, right? I've covered my weak spot by understanding that I know that that's my weak spot. I lean into the thing that I know that I'm good at and then get someone to help me with the stuff that I'm bad at. Alan, you've been absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on. We're gonna leave things there. Please go and check out Alan's channel. You're gonna to learn tons. If you're subscribed to us, then there's going to be an amazing amount of content on there that can help you and it's gonna really interest you too. And also make sure you check out his blog. Sometimes it's easier to learn from blogs as it moves in your own pace when it's written. And it is a fantastic resource. And check out Alan's website, alanspicer.com. There's a podcast on there too. I'm gonna to put all the links below this video. Alan, thank you very much for your time and for chatting with us. It's been incredibly useful. Um, hopefully we'll have you on another time soon. Take care. It's been great talking to you, Ed. You too, man.